astronomers, and it's titled The Formation of Mini Neptunes. And uh, what they're discovering, there's now over 3,700 planets that have been discovered outside of our solar system, and the one that's the most common are what we call mini Neptunes. They used to be called uh, super Earths. They're basically planets between one and ten times the mass of the Earth. But they're now calling them mini Neptunes. Neptune is 14 times the mass of the Earth. And the reason they're calling these mini Neptunes rather than super Earths is that they have a much lower density than the Earth. Their density is typical of that of Jupiter, which means they're dominated by gases. <coughs> And this paper is trying to explain why it is that these mini Neptunes are so abundant in other planetary systems and so rare in our solar system. Our solar system doesn't have any, as zero. And uh, yet these are very uh, much abundant in other planetary systems. The other thing this paper addresses is why is it that our solar system has planets like Neptune and Uranus and no other planetary system does? I mean, for example, you can go to uh, the catalog that's maintained of extrasolar planets. It's easy to find. Just put an exoplanet catalog. It pops right up. Gives you a complete list of all the planets that have been discovered and their characteristics. But uh, what you find is that uh, for planets that are in the mass range of Uranus and Neptune, uh, none of them are any farther away from their host stars than 80% of the Earth's distance uh, from the Sun. It means they're all orbiting really close to their star, uh, whereas Uranus and Neptune orbit far out like 30 times the distance uh, that Earth orbits the Sun. So we're literally finding no analogs to Uranus and Neptune. Uh, and what's interesting too is we're finding lots of planets that are one to 10 times the mass of the Earth and many of them orbit more distant uh, than Earth orbits the Sun, but we have none that are the size of Neptune Uranus that orbit that distance. That's important because until recently people said, well, the bigger planets are the easier ones to discover, and that's true. What we notice is we see the big ones, uh, probably the small ones far away, but not the big ones far away. Well, this paper basically explains why it is that uh, we're not seeing these kinds of planets and other planetary systems and why they see them in ours. And uh, in order to get planets like mini Neptunes to form, uh, you have to have a protoplanetary disk that is rich in what we call volatiles. Uh, that's a term astronomers use uh, for molecules and atoms that are lighter than water. So water would be a volatile, methane would be a volatile, uh, ammonia, and then hydrogen and helium uh, would all be in that category. And uh, that's what we notice is most protoplanetary disks are dominated by those kinds of compounds. And so when they form planets, they form lots of planets uh, like Neptune and uh, like many Neptunes. Uh, but what we notice is uh, they form beyond what's called the ice line. The ice line refers to that distance from the star where water is in a permanently frozen state. And yet the only way these gas-rich planets can form uh, is if they form beyond the ice line, but then they migrate inwards towards their star. And that's also what's another feature that's unique about our solar system is that we see a few planetary systems where the gas giants and the Neptune-sized planets don't migrate at all. Uh, but the majority are where they see very significant migration. What has happened in the case of our solar system, the gas giants and Neptune-sized planets migrated a little bit inwards towards the sun, stopped, and reversed direction. Uh, it's what's called the Grand Tack. Let me actually show you a slide of this. Here we go. So this shows the history of the movement of Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter, uh, where uh, they migrated towards the sun, especially Saturn and Jupiter, very slightly Uranus and Neptune, then they changed directions and migrated outwards. We don't see this in any other exoplanetary system, and we don't understand why, uh, but this paper mainly goes into the fact that, hey, the vast majority of protoplanetary systems are volatile rich, and uh, therefore they're going to form 
lots of these uh, mini Neptunes, uh, but because our solar system is very poor in these volatiles, it doesn't have them. And we understand why. Uh, it's because of uh, the migration of our sun from being very close to the center of our galaxy to its current position uh, right here. So, and what we notice is that uh, you know, where you see the peak of that curve, uh, let me bring it up. You're not seeing anything. <laughs> Sorry. Let me pull this up for you here. So this shows you the migration of our solar system from a position that's quite close to the galactic center where the star density is very high, and then it moves out to where the star density is very low. And uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, the abundance of uh, heavy metals, metals of heavy metals, reaches a peak about four kiloparsecs out from the center of our galaxy. That translates into about 13,000 uh, uh, light years. That's where the abundance of these metals is the highest. And we now know that our solar system formed in a dense star cluster with a minimum of 10,000 stars. And because of that density of stars, it was surrounded by supernova eruptions, and we've just recently discovered uh, two neutron stars merging together to make a black hole. That was announced on October 16th, the first ever discovery of the merging of two neutron stars to make a black hole. We now know that those kind of events are responsible for all the platinum group metals, uh, gold, silver, osmium, palladium, platinum, uh, are made when neutron stars merge. That's also where the uranium and thorium comes from, uh, almost all the uranium and thorium. And all those uh, metals are crucial for advanced light to be possible here on planet Earth. So when you go home today, you might thank God for a neutron star merging events that made all that gold and silver and platinum. And incidentally, it's not just jewelry, it's those kinds of metals that are crucial for chemotherapy drugs. So uh, any of you who've had to deal with relatives who've had cancer, you might want to thank God for a neutron star merging events that makes those chemotherapy drugs uh, possible. However, if we had stayed in that cluster, the radiation uh, from those supernova eruptions, and especially neutron star merging events, would have permanently wiped out any possibility of life. What happened was after the Earth got enriched and also it got surrounded by what are called wolf rayet stars. I won't go into the technical <coughs> details, but they literally bathe the emerging solar system with aluminum-26. That's a short-lived radiometric uh, L, uh, uh, isotope. Uh, it has a half-life of just a, uh, a couple of million years. But uh, the solar system got so heavily bombarded with aluminum-26, it stripped away virtually all the volatiles. So all the light stuff was blasted away and explains why when our solar system formed, it was extremely uh, uh, depleted uh, in those uh, light uh, elements and uh, light gases, light molecules, and quite rich in the heavier stuff. And then we got kicked out of that uh, star cluster and then we wound up where that dotted line is and notice it's a place where you got a minimal abundance of these heavy metals, a minimal abundance of these supernova eruptions and neutron star merging events, which is exactly what you need if you want life to survive. You don't want uh, Sirius, for example, to go supernova. If Sirius goes supernova, we're all in serious trouble. It's only eight light years away. <clears throat> and uh, that would definitely uh, uh, wipe us out. So, uh, you know, that's one of the unique things of our solar system, the other unique thing is that we've had this grand tack thing where instead of the uh, gas planets moving to inwards towards the sun, uh, interior to the orbit of the Earth, uh, they got to within about uh, two or three Earth distances uh, from the sun and changed direction and moved outward. And the reason for the directional change is what's another unique feature of our solar system is that it has very small asteroid and comet belts. Again, as we look at these other solar systems or the planetary systems, they either have no comets and asteroids at all 
or they've got asteroid and comet belts that are a thousand times bigger than ours. We are orbiting the only star that has five small asteroid uh, belts. And uh, what makes all this all possible is that, uh, you know, thanks to uh, Jupiter and Saturn, what happened is that uh, Saturn migrated inward at a faster rate than Jupiter did. You see that uh, here? And uh, it reached a point where Jupiter was making exactly two orbits around the sun for every single orbit that Saturn made around the sun. And that one, two resonance destabilized the comet and asteroid belts and got rid of about 99% of our asteroids and comets, but left enough uh, that there was this change in direction and the uh, gas giant planets uh, moved outward. I won't go into any more of the details. If you want the technical details and documentation, uh, they're in a book I wrote called Improbable Planet, which is over there at the table. And if you want to uh, look at this paper, I'll have it up here. But basically shows you why it's so easy to make mini Neptunes if you got lots of volatiles and uh, why it's so hard to make Neptune and Uranus type planets like we see in our solar system. And the bottom line is uh, 20 years ago when we first started to find these planets, we thought they'd all be just like the planets in our solar system. What's interesting, we've yet to find a twin of any one of the eight planets in our solar system. And that discovery led us to the conclusion every one of those eight planets we now know plays a crucial role in making advanced life possible here on planet Earth. We used to think you just had to fine-tune Earth, but we now know you've got to fine-tune the characteristics of all eight of the planets in order for advanced life to be possible. Again, if you want the details, it's an improbable planet. But I see we've got people lined up already, so I'm going to stop talking and uh, take your questions because this is an open forum, which means it's not my content, it's your content. So, Dave, go for Yeah, it. the uh, very first question, this was before these people got in line, so I'm not cutting in front of them. Uh, the very first question is a, a Bible question. Uh, 1 Peter uh, 2, 5 says, You are also a living stone, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up um, spiritual sacrifices. And the question is, what is a spiritual sacrifice, the definition in this context? Yeah, the definition in that context, it's referring to the fact that we human beings are spiritual. We are physical, but we're also spiritual. And, uh, you know, God has uh, created us to do acts of service in the spirit realm. And so, you know, what we mean by uh, making a sacrifice, a spiritual sacrifice, is basically uh, putting aside uh, your physical desires and needs and ministering to other people's uh, spiritual needs. Uh, their need to form a relationship with their creator, for example, that would be in that uh, category. And if you read the rest of uh, Second Peter 2, it fleshes that out in more detail. Hello, again. So tempted to ask astronomy questions. But my question is, uh, I know. <laughs> um, I listened to some of the archives of your Paradox class, and the very first one I listened to, when I unzipped it, long ago you were talking about your encounter with witches. I don't know if you want to talk about that tonight, but I remember you said in that talk that you encountered some warlock that knew the Bible by memory and could say every verse backwards, but he didn't understand the meaning of it. And you said there was, he could go like that, and the little girl would do cartwheels. I was well, wondering I'll if you give could you the story. That. Okay, thank you. Um, this is, goes back a couple of decades, uh, yeah. where there were a number of uh, witchcraft covens uh, in Pasadena. In fact, there was a street that had several of them. And uh, there was a lady that uh, escaped from that and uh, came here. And so uh, we wound up paying a visit at the coven. And it turns out the uh, warlock there had uh, quite a few women under his control uh, in the house. And uh, they were virtual sex slaves. And uh, he tried to just say, hey, you know, I know you guys are Christians, but you got nothing on me. 
I've got all this power. I know the Bible better than you do. In fact, I've got every uh, verse of the New Testament memorized. It says, you know, give me any verse and I'll, I'll repeat it back to you. In fact, I can repeat it back to you forwards and backwards. And indeed he could. Uh, but I just asked him a question that says, okay, um, how about you pick a verse, your choice, any verse of the New Testament, and tell us what it means. He couldn't do it. He had to memorize, but he couldn't tell you what it meant. But yeah, he had some real powers. Uh, you know, in fact, he told us, see that little girl outside there on the street? I can make her do cartwheels anytime I want. And indeed he could. But when he couldn't explain the meaning of a single Bible verse, that's when the women in the house realized this guy isn't as powerful as he claims. And they all managed to escape. Now, <clears throat> what we did after that is we had days of prayer and fasting. Basically say, you know, this street with all these coffins, this isn't appropriate. And so we got to I get together a group of about a couple of dozen people. And we had several days of prayer and fasting. End result was uh, all those coffins were gone. And uh, I don't know if that anything like that has returned since. But just shows you the power of prayer. That when something like that comes into your neighborhood, uh, you can get that taken care of. So, go ahead. Are there any side effects of the Earth when the sun has made the movement all the way across from its original location? Well, this is one of the amazing things. Uh, here we have the sun with its nascent uh, planets being kicked out of its uh, birth cluster. And how that happened is it would have, you, the sun would have had a close encounter with several supergiant stars and the gravitational interaction caused the solar system to be strongly ejected from its birthing cluster. Uh, and then when it got to the safe zone, let me bring this up again here for you. Uh, so it was born uh, relatively close to the center of our galaxy, got kicked out of that uh, dense star cluster, and uh, was shot out at high velocity outwards through the galaxy. And uh, that little circle you see there, that's what's called the co-rotation distance. That's the distance from the center of the galaxy uh, where stars revolve around the center of the galaxy at the same rate that the spiral structure rotates. And uh, that's the safest place to be for advanced life because that means that you're not going to be crossing spiral arms very often. If you're exactly at the co-rotation distance, uh, you don't cross them at all. However, if you're exactly at the co-rotation distance, you get mean motion resonances, which will actually cause uh, your solar system to be ejected inward or outward. The safest spot to be in our galaxy is slightly inside the co-rotation distance. You will cross spiral arms, but you only cross them once every billion years. And you're close enough, you're far enough away from the co-rotation distance, you don't get the mean motion resonance, the galactic mean motion resonance. So that's literally the safest place for life to be anywhere in our galaxy. And somehow, uh, when the sun got to that zone, it was slowing down by a gravitational interaction with another set of supergiant stars and managed to stop at the ideal spot uh, for advanced life. So. Uh, I've run into astronomers that say, well, getting kicked out like that, that's just a coincidence. But then you've got another coincidence having to stop at just the right place. Uh, with, and in either case, these kinds of gravitational encounters are extremely rare. I mean, we only see a few stars that are experiencing that kind of outward movement, and uh, they don't stop at the safe spot. So, uh, But yeah, because the, this happened very early in the solar system's history, we're literally talking uh, the first percent of the Earth's history is when all this took place. Uh, there was no life on planet Earth, so nothing was disturbed. And the Earth's atmosphere remained intact. Although at that time, Earth had an atmosphere 100 times thicker than it does today. And that's another whole story, how we wound up with a thin atmosphere. Okay, you're next. Um, Dr. Ross, a couple of years ago, um, I... I was made aware that there was a lot of controversy with uh, scientists about the beginning of life. And I just wonder, is there any update or has that been, you know? Yeah, I can give you an update because uh, my colleague, Fazal Rana, he's our staff biochemist. 
he and I attended the last Origin of Life Research Conference. We go to every Origin of Life Research Conference that's in North America. They held it every three years, and this year it was in San Diego, so we went. Um, and what's interesting is that each Origin of Life Conference we go to, the mood is more depressing than the previous conference <laughs> because of the fact that the new data is telling them that uh, things are a lot worse for a materialistic explanation of the origin of life. In fact, the highlight at this uh, conference back in July was Wednesday night, where they had five of the world's leading origin of life researchers on a panel uh, an answering the question, do we understand where the building blocks of uh, life come from? Uh, where do, you know, the uh, proteins, the, uh, um, the lipids, uh, the DNA and the RNA, and uh, each uh, scientist was allowed 10 to 15 minutes to speak, and then the rest of the evening was a panel discussion. All five of them said, not only do we not understand where the building blocks come from, we don't even understand where the building blocks of the building blocks come from. And then they said, we don't even understand where the building blocks of the building blocks of the building blocks come from. Because, I mean, the building blocks of the building blocks would be things like amino acids, uh, you know, things like uh, nucleobases and the sugars. And yes, uh, we don't understand where they come from, uh, but even how you get those things is not well understood, although we can make them in the lab. The challenge is, how does that happen in an interstellar molecular cloud? And, uh, you know, attending that conference, most of the lectures were about the incredible advances they've made in the lab. Uh, but the whole point is, it simply testifies that if you're going to make this work, you need a lot of technology, a lot of funding, and you need very bright and intelligent biochemists to pull it off. And uh, which means that someone a lot smarter and better educated and better funded than those biochemists must have done the deed in the first place. Although I will say this, as an astronomer, I'm persuaded that there, there are chemical processes operating in these dense molecular clouds uh, that will make a few of the simplest of the amino acids. Not the complex ones, but the simple ones like glycine. Um, but we've yet to detect glycine. And that's because there's also processes operating in these dense molecular clouds that destroy the building blocks almost as fast as they're being made. Uh, but I would predict that eventually we'll find them at a few parts per billion. Right now, we know they don't exist above one part in 10 million. And if they don't exist above one part in 10 million, you have no naturalistic model for the origin of life because you have to have them in concentration. And what was really interesting is uh, we got to have a, a conversation with a lady uh, <coughs> who's the world's top expert on what's called the homochorality problem. And uh, that's the whole idea. You can't put the amino acids together unless they're all left-handed. And you can't put the sugars together unless they're all, uh, pardon me, yeah, the, uh, all the amino acids had to be left-handed, the ribose sugars all to be right-handed. And everywhere we look, we see that they tend to be mixed up ratios of left and right-handed. And uh, the only mechanism we know of uh, for making them all, all the amino acids left-handed is circularly polarized ultraviolet light. And in the lab, we've maybe been able to get about a 30% excess. However, to make it work for the origin of life, it's got to be 100%. And there's a very interesting paper given at an origin of life conference where they said what we notice is the more success we get in making them towards 100%, the less of the sample we have. And basically concluded, if you want 100% uh, left-handed amino acids, you have zero amino acids left. Because the way you get them uh, towards a greater preference for left-handed, you destroy the right-handed ones <coughs> at a higher rate than the left-handed ones. But you're basically destroying both. You just destroy the right-handed ones at a faster rate. And if you get 100% uh, left-handed, you basically wind up with nothing left. And uh, same thing with the ribose sugars. So that's the latest on origin of life research. And uh, we have a podcast at reasons.org uh, where we give you a, a much more detailed update 
on what's happening in Origin of Life uh, research. I don't think we got the book here, but you can also get a book from us, Origins of Light, which incidentally uh, got peer reviewed. Our book on the origins of life, we got a phone call from David Deemer. He was actually one of the five panelists that was there. And uh, it wasn't at this conference, but a previous one where he said, I hear you guys have come up with a book on the origin of life. Uh, do you mind if I review it? And are you okay with me publishing it in Origins of Life and Evolution of the Biosphere? And he said, by the way, I'm not a Christian, I'm an atheist, I'm gonna be very critical. And we said, well, we can only benefit from your criticism. Please be as critical as you can. It can only help us uh, you know, fine tune our model. Well, it did get published, and if you read the uh, article, he basically says that our book, Origins of Life, was the most uh, comprehensive in its scientific analysis of the state of origin of life, uh, that it was interdisciplinary. He said, I like everything about the book except the Jesus Christ part. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, Hugh, I have a question, and uh, I have to uh, put a preface before this question because I don't think it's a very good question, but somebody asked it, so I will put it to them. And I'm putting the preface on there as I've been actively sharing my faith for 32 years, um, and, uh, and I hear all Christians a lot of times um, um, a question in judging the salvation of other people's hearts as they're living or, or, or as they die. And uh, from my experience talking to people and from Scripture, um, Christians really need to be careful about judging the heart of other human beings because it's only something God can see. And we've talked about, you know, bed, bedside confessions. And, and so, like, when people tell me, do you think that person's going to go to hell? I said, well, unless I was there or somebody I trust and I know the person was cussing and swearing at Jesus Christ as they died, that's about the only person I could guarantee is probably going to hell. Anybody else, it, it's an unknown commodity. Would you, would you agree to that? Well, I'm running into a lot of people who say, how do I know if I'm really uh, a Christian? <clears throat> how do I know that I'm going to be with God for the rest of eternity? Well, what we see in the book of Philippians chapter 2 is that when you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into you. And one way you can know for sure that the Holy Spirit has taken a permanent residence in you is that Holy Spirit gives you the desire and the power uh, to obey the commands of Christ. And therefore, we shouldn't measure someone's Christianity by how often they go to church, how often they pray, how much of the Bible they know. Do they have desire uh, to read the Bible and to pray and to follow God that's beyond what they had before? And that can be really reassuring because people can say, well, yeah, my desires have changed. Well, if your desires have changed, regardless of your actual performance, uh, that means that you really are. Uh, in the hands of the Creator. And what I tell people is, okay, who do you want to spend the rest of eternity with? I mean, do you really want to spend the rest of eternity uh, in a relationship with God, submitting to God's authority? Then that's where you're going to go. But if you want nothing to do with God and want to be as far away from God as possible for the rest of eternity, then God's got a place for you. So you basically get to choose where you want to spend eternity. I, I tell people, God does not send people to hell. People choose hell. It's the best possible place if you want nothing to do with God. Uh, but if God's the best thing you can think of, yeah, I'd really like to, to, to spend eternity with him. Then, uh, and as it says uh, in uh, the Bible, if you seek after God, he will find you. And are you seeking after God? Or are you running away from him? Because there are people who want nothing to do with God, and that's fine. Uh, God's going to give you the desires of your heart. That's an excellent frame of reference for this question. Now that I'll pose the question now that we have the frame of reference. So the question is, if someone is a true seeker, you know, no, they've received a little bit of light, but maybe have not accepted Jesus Christ, and, and while they're seeking, something happens and they die, what do you think that they will go to hell or heaven, or, or can we even say? Very good question, and that's answered well in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, which basically says God sends his light out to every human being. And if you go to uh, John's first letter, 1 John, he defines that light. He says God's light is a combination of his truth, uh, his life, and his love. And that's gone out to every human being in one form or another. And it says if you want that love and life and truth, then God will make sure you get more and you'll proceed to salvation. 
But if you reject the light that he gives you, say, I want nothing to do with that, then you proceed towards condemnation. So you'll be judged based on what you do with the light that God gives to every human being. And a lot of people tell me, well, you know, you can't be saved unless you understand the Bible, and therefore you have to be literate in order to be a Christian. No, God sends his light out in a variety of ways. And so it's not just the Bible where God reveals himself. It tells us repeatedly in passages of the Bible, God reveals himself through nature as well as through the Bible. Everybody has received God's light. Now, it does say that some have received more than others. But I stand by the promise, if you accept the light that God has given you, he'll see to it that you get more, and he'll see to it that you proceed towards salvation. It's the direction you're headed that counts, not exactly where you are right now. Go ahead. Uh, what's the latest on the search for life on Mars? The latest for the search for life on Mars is that uh, they're hoping you, the taxpayer, uh, <laughs> will fund several more missions to Mars. Uh, some are already scheduled, so there's going to be more uh, missions to Mars uh, with the goal of trying to find the chemical signatures of life. And I've been on record since the 1980s that eventually, eventually they will find those signatures for the simple reason that we know that a significant quantity of Earth life has been transported from the Earth to Mars. Now, it's not a lot. I mean, meteor, Im meteoritic impact of the Earth uh, over the course of life's history on Earth has deposited uh, about 200 uh, kilograms of uh, Earth's soil on every 100 square kilometers of Mars. Now, keep in mind that one ton of Earth's soil contains 100 quadrillion microbes. And so uh, the biological material of the Earth is present on Mars. It's also present in every other solar system body. However, 200 kilograms spread over 100 square kilometers, that's a pretty thin layer. So it's not going to be easy to find the remains of Earth life on Mars, uh, but eventually, if we keep uh, you know, sending missions, eventually we'll find it. Now, I've spoken at NASA Houston where I said there's a better place we can go to find the remains of Earth's life, and that would be the moon. Because in the moon, we're not talking just 200 kilograms, we're talking an average of 20,000 kilograms. And so I think it'd be relatively straightforward uh, to go to the moon with a different mission than the Apollo program. The Apollo program's mission was to recover pristine lunar rocks. So I've been arguing we need to go back to the moon with a different mission to recover Earth-transported soil. And uh, the advantage there is that on planet Earth, the remains of Earth's first life has been destroyed by the geology of the Earth. However, the moon has virtually no geological activity. And most of the Earth's soil that's been transported uh, to the moon happened during the first few hundred million years of life on planet Earth. That's when the meteoritic impact was the most intense. And so uh, we have a really good chance of finding the fossils of Earth's first life on the moon. And it's a worthy investment of our taxpayer dollars because we're not going to find it here on Earth. The best place to find the fossils of Earth's first life is on the moon. And I think it's exciting because we can go to the moon and see who got the origin of life model right, uh, the theists or the non-theists. Because the theists and the non-theists have very different models of what that Earth's first life should look like. And as I told the astronomers and the astronauts there at uh, uh, NASA Houston, last time I checked, if you add up all the non-theists and theists in the United States, it makes up 100% of the U.S. taxpayer base. So everybody should be excited about going to the moon and seeing who got it right. But you could also go to do it on Mars. It's just it's going to be a lot more expensive and a lot more challenging to do it on Mars than to do it on the moon. And incidentally, you don't have to send people. Uh, whether it's the moon or Mars, it can be done for a whole lot less money with machines. So no need to send astronauts we can send uh, machines up there for probably one-tenth of one percent of the cost. Uh, 
Hugh, I had the privilege of working at JPL when we landed Viking on Mars, uh, the very first lander to land on Mars. And, and uh, I personally am very disappointed in JPL because uh, all of their press releases and NASA's press uh, downplay how hostile uh, Mars is to current life. When people come and talk to me about Mars, um, they think it's like kind of like lush and green or something because they don't talk about you know, how dry it is. They don't talk about how cold it is. They don't talk about how poor the soil is. And, and, and I've talked to school children that, that when they, they said, you know, they, well, they said they announced they found water on Mars. So they're picturing there's ponds and streams and stuff. Well, would you agree that NASA, because of this pursuit for life, has downplayed how hostile Mars, I mean, just for example, obviously, if you took a cup of water and a robot uncovered that water four feet off the ground and you poured it, the water would be gone before it hit the ground. That's how dry Mars is. Right. And people just don't know how bad it is there. It's, it is really, really not a hostile, a hostile environment, would you agree? Yeah, what's driving it is that we do know that if you go back about four billion years, there is a brief moment in time when Mars was wet. Now, not as wet as the Earth, uh, but there was a time when you had liquid water on the surface of Mars. However, we know that that liquid water quickly uh, disappeared because unlike Earth, uh, there wasn't a carbonate cycle. I mean, what happened is the moment you get liquid water on Mars, it sets up a chemical reaction uh, that converts uh, that water uh, into carbonates, and the carbonates remain as carbonates. They don't get recycled like they do here on Earth uh, back to water and carbon dioxide. So the water and carbon dioxide will immediately react to make the carbonates, which quickly uh, turns Mars cold and dry. And that's one thing that's well established. Yes, there was a time when Mars was warmer and wetter, uh, but it very quickly became cold and dry because of this, quote, carbonate uh, crisis. And that happened literally four billion years ago. And ever since then, uh, Mars has been cold and dry. Uh, but even when it was uh, wet and warm, you still had the problem that the soil content had 60 times as much sulfur as Earth soil does. I don't know how many of you saw that movie, The Martian, uh, which shows Matt Damon living on potatoes that he grows on uh, Martian soil. Uh, you can't grow potatoes on Martian soil. Uh, the sulfur con, I mean, the problem with that much sulfur is it's very acidic. And uh, basically uh, would make any life form other than acidophiles uh, impossible. And acidophiles, all we're talking about are these very slow growing uh, microbes. And uh, certainly not something you can evolve life from, even in the most optimistic evolutionary model. Um, so, so far, they haven't really been able to understand human consciousness in the scientific community. Um, or the, really even to define it, I think. Um, I'm wondering if there's any materialistic aspects that you've ever read about about consciousness in the human soul, if it has a weight? Well, the best that I've seen in an attempt to try to explain human consciousness from a materialistic perspective uh, would be, the, uh, they were claiming that the microtubules inside the cells, that there is some unknown quantum uh, physics phenomena working in there that might explain human consciousness. That was proposed by Roger Penrose, the uh, famous British physicist. However, in the same books where he was pr making this speculation, it was very clear just saying, uh, that's the only thing I think of uh, that could possibly do it. He says, uh, you know, I have no idea how it would work. But he also made the point in uh, that book, Shadows of the Mind, and the Emperor's New Mind, I think the two books are called, is that when you look at the human brain, uh, the physics of the brain explains the hardware features of the brain, but it doesn't explain the software features. And he says, that's the big mystery. How do we explain the software that's present in the brain? Where does that come from? But he says, there's more than that. When you look at the human brain or the human mind, what we see is not just hardware and software, we see a programmer. And so that's, he says, that's the ultimate problem of trying to explain consciousness from a materialistic perspective. How do you explain the programmer? How do you explain the control? And uh, my colleague, uh, Ken Samples, he's our staff philosopher. Between the two of us, we got over 50 books 
uh, written by scientists who are non-theists trying to explain uh, consciousness. And when they're talking about human consciousness, they basically conclude, every one of them, we have no idea. Uh, what they're trying to do is say, well, we see something uh, conscious-like in other animals. So they're struggling trying to explain the consciousness of an ant. Uh, but it's really debatable whether we can claim that an ant is uh, conscious. Uh, maybe dogs and cats, but uh, you know, and one thing we s recognize is that humans are the only uh, life forms on planet Earth that are conscious to the point where we ask questions like, why am I here? Uh, what's going to happen to me after I die? I mean, even the most intelligent non-human animals never engage in that kind of philosophical activity that kind of self ins uh, inward inspection. Now, some of the people have argued, well, um, some of the non-human animals must be conscious like we are because they have theory of mind. And theory of mind is the capacity to read the mind of somebody else. And, uh, but what we notice is that happens when you've got the more intelligent animals that are bonded to you as pets. And so, for example, I saw that in uh, my son's dog, because I would come home uh, from uh, work, and a dog loved to give me a great greeting, and I would smile back at the dog. Well, dogs in the wild, uh, when they smile, it's a form of an expression of aggression. They're showing their teeth, and basically they do that to scare off uh, other uh, dogs that are trying to muscle in in their territory, or to scare <laughs> off other predators. Uh, but what happened with my son's dog it basically would show its teeth as a form of greeting. And basically what's happening is the dog realizing, okay, I smile at him, uh, it must be something I like, so the dog figures that out and smiles back at me. That's a limited form of theory of mind, but it's nothing anywhere as sophisticated as we see with human beings, where we look at one another and we figure out what we're thinking. And so, uh, you know, there are people very good at that. They can just look at you and know exactly what you're thinking. And uh, so my dog might realize that I want a greeting, but that's about as far as it goes. So, um, and then with humans, we see a level of consciousness where we communicate uh, with symbols. That's something that's unique to human beings. Only humans uh, communicate with symbols, with numbers and with letters. Uh, you know, in a book I wrote on this, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job, I made the point that you can take the smartest non-human animal and train them over 20 years to be able to figure out and respond to a stop sign? Can't do it. Even something as simple as a stop sign is beyond the capability of the response mechanism of the smartest non-human animals. And yet you can take a one-year-old child and they're able to figure out what letters and numbers mean. So, and they're able to engage in complex conversation. I mean, parrots are able to mimic us, uh, but they're not able to engage in a paragraph-type conversation. They can just simply repeat after us something we said to them over and over again. And what I said yesterday, too, uh, the world's leading uh, research institute on artificial intelligence and the attempt to achieve a conscious machine, that's MIT. Uh, the phrase out of MIT is, we're 10 years away from actually making a conscious machine and always will be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're next. <laughs> what was this extrasolar object that came into our solar system, circled around our, our sun and then exited the other, a few days ago? Yeah, a few days ago, astronomers announced that they had found the first ever object that they know for certain came from outside of our solar system. And uh, we didn't get a good enough measure on it to see whether it was a comet or an asteroid. Uh, we do know it was about uh, 400 meters across. So we know its size, but because we couldn't get its composition, we don't know whether it's a comet or an asteroid. But its orbit told us it came from outside the solar system. Now this is something astronomers have uh, understood as definitely probable because we've seen lots of other stars with word clouds. Let me define the term. The biggest uh, cloud of comets and asteroids orbiting our solar system is the word cloud. It's the most distant. 
and uh, it extends from about uh, 20 billion miles out, out from the sun out to 2 trillion miles. And uh, to give you some idea, uh, the uh, closest star is, uh, gee, uh, 25 trillion miles away. So it goes up pretty far, 2 trillion miles. And some have said, speculated maybe the Earth cloud goes out as far as 4 to 6 trillion miles. Well, given that other stars also have clouds similar to our Earth cloud, it means as the sun gets close to another star, it could steal comets and asteroids away from the Earth cloud of another star. And our star is uh, more massive than 85% of all the other stars that exist. So if we make an encounter with another star, given the fact that we're one of the heavier stars, one of the more massive stars, we're more likely to steal uh, comets and asteroids from the star than they are to steal one from us. But we also know that this kind of exchange of, uh, between uh, intercounters with stars means that there's got to be lots of asteroids and comets that are running in between the stars. And so as our star is moving around the center of the galaxy, it's inevitably going to bump in uh, to what we call uh, these uh, bachelor stars and bachelor asteroids, unattached stars and asteroids. And so this may be one of those, or it may be one we captured from another star system. It's the first one we've seen, uh, but we know that uh, there are probably many more just like it. And uh, it's thanks to the fact that we got powerful telescopes today that we got the potential of detecting these. But yeah, just a few days ago, they announced the first one that they know for certain came from outside the solar system. Go ahead. Yeah, I was reading about a study that was just done in 2014 where some scientists were trying to study uh, dog DNA and wolf DNA to see if they could get a, a date via that method for when humankind first started domesticating animals because they, in the theory, the dog was the first animal domesticated perhaps even before pasture animals. And a lot of people will tell you that the gray wolf species was a species that was captured by humans and because it was under human uh, control that when it had mutations that diverged it into what we know today as dogs, that that's the origin of our dogs is the gray wolf species. But this 2014 study showed that that can't be the case, that you can't look at a modern wolf species <laughs> and figure dogs came from it, that the differences in DNA as they were studying the DNA clocks uh, told them that indeed you can't say that any modern wolf species was a progenitor of, of today's dog species, that they therefore to follow the evolutionary model they had to have a common ancestor at least 12 to 16,000 years ago that no longer exists. But that's quite an article of faith to me to say there's a dotted line somewhere in the past that's a species we have no fossils for that was the progenitor of two different species lines that we see today. Um, I wondered if you'd heard anything about that. Yeah, I've heard about that. And uh, there are papers out saying that it's more complicated than dogs coming from a single species, that they actually come from a combination of species. So foxes, coyotes, wolves, dingoes, and other uh, like African wild dogs, that all of these uh, would have played a role in the different uh, dogs that we have today. And what's interesting is all those different species uh, can interbreed. And so the fact that we have such a broad spectrum of dogs, uh, to really nail it down, you gotta figure out the date for when humans began to domesticate these uh, species, and uh, we don't have a good date. Uh, you're right that we know it happened early, but exactly how early, we don't know. So, but, I mean, you can see components of the fox DNA in certain dog breeds today, as uh, well as the wolf. So we know for sure the wolf had played a role, the fox played a role, and possibly uh, you know, African wild dogs and coyotes. Dingoes, probably not much at all. So. It seems like, seems like picking and choosing when your model is affirmed by evidence, and you just put the model into the 
searchable where you think. Yeah. Well, Hugh, right. Hugh, Hugh, the point on this obviously is, is that's the answer to every single species. When you ask biologists where does something come from, th there are empty lines to almost everything. They, can, they, they, they make this tree, but there's no evidence to connect the dots for anything. What you just said is true for humans, it's true for just about every single animal. You know that 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 you can't find another previous ants, uh, you know, species and link the two together. You know, they thought Neanderthals were were, mm -hmm. were from humans. Once we got Neanderthal, the oh gee was that's not it. So we have no dotted line back for humans. We don't. I mean, this this answer is the same answer for almost every species. Would you agree? Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so yeah, yeah. And it's one uh, of the reasons I don't believe evolution anymore because there's no evidence. And they, they're also thinking that uh, the first domesticated animal is probably the goat. So, because uh, that's that's the earliest evidence we have for large-scale domestication is for goats, and uh, goats are a whole lot easier to tame than wolves. So, I mean, I know that by personal experience. I've run into wild goats that you can tame within under one minute. Uh, they're probably the easiest to tame animal of all. Oh yeah, yeah, and they like they like humans, so they they follow you, and uh, uh, they're very sociable, and they like hanging around humans, and had seem to have no fear of us, and although they like they like to eat your clothes, so watch <laughs> out. Whereas a wolf is difficult. I mean, you see that in Genesis one, how the carnivores are difficult to tame, the herbivores are easy to tame. Go ahead. I have a Christian friend, um, she's 53 years old, and she was telling me about her six children, one of them being adopted, and seven more in heaven, because she had miscarriages, seven miscarriages, and from fetus to full term. And she says, you know, I'll see them in heaven. And I thought, well, you know how you talk about even the fetus can see the light or not? Mm -hmm. um, and the Bible's saying, you know, being passed down from generation to generation, is it most likely that all those um, miscarriages with their children more likely will see the light because coming from Christian parents? Maybe. <laughs> uh, you can't give a clear answer to that because, yeah, it all depends what those uh, seven fetuses did with the light that God gave them. And certainly there are advantages to having Christian parents, uh, but it's not a guarantee. A lot of people read uh, 1 Corinthians 7 and treat it as a guarantee. 1 Corinthians 7 just says that God will bestow protection on the relatives of Christians, that the same protection is bestowed on the Christians. But there is no guarantee that uh, if you're a Christian mother, all your children will be Christians. It all depends what they do with the light that God gives them. And with fetuses, you're basically speculating. Go ahead. One second. Um, if you uh, um, want to be in on the drawing, it's this time to turn in your card, and, and um, we have somebody collecting them here. So if you've got a card, raise ways up your card so we can collect it. Go ahead. Uh, I've I've read uh, some of what you said about probabilities and these amazing figures of ten to the fifty seventh power, and then on way beyond that. Uh, but one thing is missing, at least in my mind, not just perhaps by not reading enough of what you said, is uh, kind of a listing of, um, so I can have kind of a listing of, okay, there's this probability on top of this one, on top of this one, and I'm not sure what most of those are. A lot of it has to do with distances from the sun and right, many right. things. And then there's probability and then there is faith which is the key to it so well there is a resource that you can access for free it's at reasons.org slash fine tuning uh, without a dash between fine and tuning if you go to that it'll pop up a 300 page compendium for you uh, which lists all the fine tuned characteristics and also uh, shows you a calculation of the dependency factors between them because they're not all independent some are but not all and then a bottom line calculation and what the probability is for getting all those characteristics within the necessary fine-tuned range without invoking uh, super intelligent supernatural intervention and uh, yeah that the probability is less than one chance in 10 to the 1050th power 
So, and that's roughly equivalent to you winning the California lottery 150 consecutive times where you buy only one ticket each time. Or as one mathematician friend of mine put it, it's the same probability if you buy no tickets at all. <laughs> um, I'm going to read a scripture from Romans, mm -hmm. the 18th chapter. Um, no, it's Romans 8, 18. It says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation awaits an eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one that subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. So my question is kind of two part is, what happens when we die? And where do we go? Is it another dimension? Or we, I don't, we probably don't know. And then you've talked a lot about a new heavens and a new earth. Is this talking about that the physicality or the physics that we have today will no longer apply? Or is, is this talking about something different? Yeah, Romans uh, 8, 18 to 23 that you just read uh, basically is stating that uh, God has subjected the entire universe to a pervasive law decay. And we can observe that. No matter where you look, you see that the second law of thermodynamics is operating. Everything is decaying. And sometimes I tell audiences, if you don't believe that, look at the person sitting next to you. Uh, everything is subject to decay. So uh, moreover, the decay is uh, quite high. Uh, but Romans 8 is also giving us a promise. A day will come uh, when the creation will be liberated from its bondage to decay, but that will not happen until the full number of human beings that God intends to redeem have indeed been redeemed. And the reason for that is that for humans to be redeemed, you need the law of decay to be in operation. It's something I explained in my book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is, that it's the second law of thermodynamics that keeps the expression of human evil in check. Uh, it works in the following way. The more evil you commit, the more work you gotta do to undo the damage of your evil, the more time you gotta waste, and the more pain you experience. And because we human beings don't enjoy extra pain, extra work, and wasted time, it acts as a motivation for us to avoid those kinds of activities. And so that law of decay is gonna remain in effect as long as evil is a threat to humanity. But we have the promise in the Bible uh, that God is working to eliminate evil once and for all. And once that is achieved, uh, then there's no longer a need for a universe uh, with the second law of thermodynamics, or a universe with a law of gravity, or a universe with electromagnetism. And that that's when God replaces the universe with its laws of physics, with a brand new creation. And so you read about that in Revelation 21 and 22. The new creation, the new earth, the new universe, uh, where you have completely different physics and where evil and suffering will never exist for the rest of eternity. Uh, but that state will not come into existence until the full number of human beings uh, that God intends to redeem have indeed been redeemed. So he's basically saying, you may not like this law of decay, uh, but it's for your own good that I'm subjecting the whole universe and you to this law of decay. And now when I'm done with it, then I'm gonna replace it where nothing will decay from that point onwards. I mean, that's gonna be exciting to be the new creation where you won't have to maintain anything because nothing decays. Where is the realm where people go now? Okay. The Bible tells us that when a redeemed human being, someone who actually has a relationship with Jesus Christ, has repented of the rebellion and has asked the Holy Spirit to come into their life, receive the forgiveness of their offenses against God and others, uh, that when they die, they go to a different realm. 
They're not in this universe. They go to a completely different dimensional realm and they go into a state of sleep. Now in that state of sleep, they're aware of what's going on here on the earth. So they, they can observe what's happening, but they can't interfere. They're, uh, they're spectators only. And so you see uh, different Bible authors speaking about how the dead in Christ are part of this cloud of witnesses that watches what's happening here in the face of the earth. One way to put it, while you're alive, you're on the football playing field. Uh, when you pass, you go up into the stands and become a spectator. So you will be able to observe. Now the Bible is not clear to the extent with which we can observe. But there are passages, for example, making it clear that the dead in Christ are aware of when people repent and give their lives to Jesus Christ. They're aware when people commit evil deeds. And uh, they actually experience emotions. So they grieve, for example, when they see people committing evil deeds. So, yeah, you're not only observing, your feelings are intact, your spirit is intact, but you're not able to interfere with what's going on here. You're a passive observer. Well, it's not heaven. It's uh, a waiting place. Uh, once the full number of human beings that God intends to redeem have been redeemed, this is in Revelation chapter 7, it says God will wake up all the spectators. They'll be standing before him. They'll receive brand new bodies, bodies that will never decay. You won't get old. Uh, you won't get injured. You'll be getting an incorruptible uh, body, a body that can't be destroyed. And then you're going to be given a career. Uh, God's got a job for you. Uh, in the new creation. And depending on how you've lived your life here, uh, you'll get an appropriate uh, career. And I think that's important for Christians to realize. In this life here on earth, you're in training for a future career. And basically you got both the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter saying, take your training seriously. It has eternal consequences. And so just realize you're in the equivalent of some kind of advanced college course uh, getting you prepared for a future career, and uh, don't blow off your education. This is the one chance to, to get things ready. Okay, we're going to do the drawing. So, so which books do we have first? We'll do it like we did yesterday, right? All three. We have three books that are going to be given away. Old Earth or Evolutionary Creation? This new one? Yeah, that's a two views book. It's a dialogue between scientists of biologos and reasons to believe. And the Controversy of the Ages? That's two theologians uh, doing a critical analysis of reasons to believe biologos and answers in Genesis. And Improbable Planet? That's my latest book on the fine tuning design of the Earth that makes possible the redemption of billions of human beings. So I've shuffled these up. You got them all shuffled? Like Very good. Shuffled, so okay. <laughs> I'll grab one at random. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'll pick the one that you want when you... Okay, we got Cara DeCaro. All right. Ah. <laughs> you get your choice. Okay. <clears throat> Doug McComb. McComb. <clears throat> yeah, this is uh, Helen. Uh, K O U G. Oh, Kao Young. Uh, yeah, all right, very all good. Right. <laughs> all right. Can we continue our questions? Oh, Jocelyn wanted me to announce those. Uh, what are the rocks that you got from uh, from shells and? Okay. 
some shells in that little uh, basket over there that you got from South Dakota, right? Oh, I see. Okay. So fossils and interesting minerals, all free for the asking. So. Uh, so, uh, Bible question for you. Um, this is about whom t should we fear and what power does the devil have? Um, in Matthew and Luke and in Hebrews, I read what seems to say we should fear only God, God the Father, I suppose, uh, or Jesus in the judgment. But then um, in Hebrews also it says, talks about um, the devil having the power of death. So the question is, what power does the devil have? Should we fear him at all? Is the Bible telling us don't fear the devil, only fear God? <coughs> is it God who has the authority to cast into hell? And if the devil does have the power of death, as Hebrews chapter 2.14 says, what exactly is that power? How is it related to the power to cast into hell? Well, I would argue that Satan, the most powerful of the demons, has got two strategies. One strategy is to get you to fear him a whole lot. Another strategy is to get you to fear him not at all. And I think these Bible passages you're quoting are basically trying to bring some sense of balance to this. Realizing as powerful as Satan is, he's the most powerful creature God made, he can't create. And so he's limited in what he can do. And there's other limitations upon him as well. Um, and these demons and Satan uh, can only attack you if you give them permission. And I think that's what these passages are saying. Be careful how you live your life, because Satan is powerful, his demons are powerful, and if you allow them to attack, uh, they can do you significant damage. Uh, but they need permission to, to be able to do that. And how do they get permission? By you trying to find truths of some other means rather than pursuing it from God, uh, mainly by going after occult instrumentation. That's basically what the occult is all about, trying to get power and knowledge apart from God. Um, you know, and I gave a whole list of that in my book, uh, Hidden uh, uh, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men. And so we're more warned all the way through the Bible to avoid idolatry, to avoid astrology, uh, to avoid witchcraft, uh, to avoid uh, trying to make contact with spiritual beings, uh, because that's basically giving them permission to invade your life. And if you do that, they can do you serious harm. How serious? Well, uh, they can injure you. They can even kill you. However, they need permission. You don't give them permission, they can't touch you. So, um, but yeah, I know a lot of people who think demons don't exist, and uh, that can be a problem. And other people think they got overwhelming power. That's also a problem. So just keep it all in perspective. Hi, um, I'm a hospice volunteer. I've been a hospice volunteer for about 34 years. I have noticed that the people with, uh, that are atheist have the worst deaths. And I believe it's because they believe in nothingness. And I have seen a man that was, had his faith was so strong that he refused any kind of medication because he wanted to see our father uh, with his eyes wide open. But in hospice, there is a lot of uh, faiths where people come in with different faiths. And uh, I feel that my job there is just to love them through their process. But I also have a question on, on the sense that when Jesus said that my father has many mansions, I was just wondering whether that's got to do with uh, levels of faith that people have. Thank well, you. Yeah, no, good question. And, uh, you know, as a hospice worker, I think you've noticed that uh, people are particularly receptive when they know the end is near. It's interesting how we can live our lives when life is good and we got good health, we got money, uh, we have lots of distractions, and we just don't think about the fact that our life is going to end. 
uh, but there's something the doctor telling you, you've got three months to live, that makes you wonder, gee, I guess I better start thinking about the most important issues of life. And I've personally seen that myself, is that I managed to talk to a guy who is two days away from death, He'd been an atheist all of his life, but once he realized that this is the end, he, would, he very much wanted to talk and uh, wound up in those last few hours giving his life to Christ. So uh, that can happen. I've even then seen that happen with a guy who was in a coma. Uh, interesting story where I got a call from a, a nurse like you and basically said, I've got this atheist in, uh, that I'm taking care of. And uh, he's in a complete coma, but would you come and talk to him? And I said, yeah, I'll come and talk to him. Well, when I got there, the wife and the daughter were there. And the wife was a very aggressive atheist. She says, no, I don't want you talking to my husband. I says, don't disturb him. He's made up his mind. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. Let me tell you what I want to share with him. And if you say don't share it with him, I won't. Uh, but if it's, it's okay, then I'll go share it with him. And she says, okay, tell me what you want to say to him. Well, I said it loud enough that he could hear it. <laughs> 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 and she was, the, mo the wife was about, uh, you know, 20 feet away from her husband, but the daughter was holding his hand. And the daughter kept saying to her mother, he's squeezing my hand. And she says, he hasn't squeezed anybody's hand in two weeks. It says, there's no way, so you must be dreaming that. And uh, then when I actually got to the gospel presentation, the daughter said, he just opened his eyes and blinked. And the wife said, you, you, must, you must be dreaming. He's never opened his eyes in the past two weeks. So, uh, um, and then I got a call from the nurse the next day. She says, you know, when everybody was gone, I went and repeated everything you said to him, and the same thing happened. So he said, I think he just gave his life to Christ. So... Uh, so it can happen even when people are in a coma. And I tell people that too. You're probably telling that as a hospice nurse. Just because someone has a coma, don't presume they can't hear what you're saying. <coughs> right? They, they probably can. And so take that into account. But even when they're in a coma, they may be very spiritually receptive. So, because they know they're at death's door. And, uh, you know, I heard from, there's a pastor here at the church, Richard Anderson. Uh, he's no longer here, but uh, he was here for 40 years. And uh, he really liked to visit people that were on death's door. That was kind of his special thing to do. But he told me that he had been with Christians at 300 different instances where they were lucid at the point of death. And he says, consistently what I heard from them when they were lucid right up to the moment of death is, I have to say goodbye. He's calling me. He's calling me by name, and they would basically walk, and he says, you know, I heard that so frequently that it made me realize Psalm 23 is right on target, that when you cross that threshold of death, you get a personal escort across that threshold. I'm with you, my rod and my staff, I'll comfort you, and he says, I've seen that over and over again. But he also said, I got to watch atheists dying who are very committed to their atheism, and he says when they were loose up to the point of death, they would actually rejoice in the fact that they were going to hell. And they'd be screaming and yelling and cursing God as they were dying. And he says it was just horrifying for me to hear that. I said, well, how often did you hear that? He says dozens of times. Now, most often when people are at the point of death, they're not that lucid. And so they pass quietly and you do really don't know what's going on. But isn't it interesting where you really do know what's going on you see those two extremes. So thank you for coming up and sharing. And uh, you know, people like you, we need to be in prayer for because you're at people's greatest need. So uh, that's one thing I've noticed. It seems like the last day of your life is when you're most spiritually receptive. Go ahead. Yes, um, there was a program on Netflix and I talked to you about it one time. I think it was called is Genesis uh, scientific? Well, there's one thing in there that uh, is it Genesis? Is, is Genesis I'm, history? Is, uh, yeah, Genesis scientific. It, they interviewed you, and then never put anything into uh, 
their Netflix program. Well, I'm debating the producer on November 11th. Okay. So. In this, um, I think the Hebrew word, word for day is yom. Correct. And you have always said that yom can mean many. Four different definitions. Right. They had a, quote, Hebrew scholar, very dignified with his little silver finger reading Hebrew saying Yom can only mean 24 hours period is he just being stubborn or and and I don't mean this badly but if he were up there next to you we'd probably believe him because he looks so dignified <laughs> so not that you don't uh, that's a wrong terminology but I mean he just looked extremely scholarly but um, I've always used your example that Yom can mean many things, many time periods. Well, what he's probably saying, I mean, I'm going to be watching the uh, video in preparation for this debate. Um, but I'm guessing what's going on there is he's saying, in the context of Genesis 1, it can only mean 24 hours. I've never heard a younger theologian say it has only one definition of 24 hours. It's in all the lexicons that it's got four distinct definitions. But they'll argue, if you look at the context, it's got to be a 24-hour period. My response to that is, look at the context, and you can see, without any knowledge of Hebrew, that the word day must have at least three distinct definitions, because mm -hmm. three are used in the first page. So for example, it talks about creation day one. It's contrasting days and nights. That's the word day referring to the daylight hours. Creation day four, it's contrasting seasons, days, and years. That's day referring to 24 hours. And in Genesis 2, 4, it uses the word day to refer to the entirety of creation history. That's day as a long period of time. Now there's a fourth definition, which means part of the daylight hours, like from noon to 3 p.m. But yeah, every lexicon will tell you it's got those four distinct definitions, and the Bible uses all four of those definitions in different passages. And uh, so I'd be surprised if any younger scholar would try to dispute that. But a lot of them will claim, in the context of Genesis 1, the days have to be six consecutive 24-hour periods. And you know, when I first picked up a Bible at age 17, it's like, well, you got an evening and a morning telling you that the first six days had a start point and an end point, but there is no evening and morning for the seventh day. And you got three passages, John 5, Psalm 95, and Hebrews 4, that tell us we're still in God's seventh day. So that, I think, seals it. Uh, these days uh, must be six consecutive long periods of time. That may come up when I debate them on November 11th. We'll see. I don't remember him talking about context. He was just very dogmatic. That's 24 hours, period. Well, can't mean anything else. So my friends have watched the DVD, and they said, Hugh, what's going to upset you the most is they bring all these scientists on who claim all the scientific evidence uh, proves that it's uh, young. None of it proves that it's old. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that debate goes. It's going to be in the Moody uh, Radio Network uh, at Hugh, 11 o'clock on November 11th. Uh, Hugh, in context, I had this co same conversation with a Hebrew scholar just a few days ago, and the context that I think that was left out was is that these people that are claiming it only could be 24 hours leave out the context that they're saying anytime Yom is used with a number that it must be 24 is what they're saying, and since in Genesis there's a number attached to it, it must be 24. Um, do, do you have a response to that, that, that it must yeah, be I definitely 24 do. if there's a number there? That's the, that's the context. Well, there's two responses. Number one, there's a passage in Hosea chapter 6 where it numbers the days, and the days are long periods of time. So the idea that every time it's attached to a number is 24 hours is falsified just within the Bible itself. The second point is uh, those hundreds of instances where days are numbered elsewhere in the Bible is describing human history. The only place in the Bible where it uses uh, numbered days to describe natural history is Genesis 1. So they're comparing apples to oranges. And uh, yeah, because it's human history, we've been here a lot less time than the earth has been here. But Hosea 6-2 uh, 
uh, basically prophesies that the Jews as a people, as a nation, will be without a king for one day, a second day, and then the king will come. And uh, that's a reference to the diaspora, uh, where the Jews uh, were ejected from the land and had no nation for 2,000 years. But today, they have a nation, they have a ruler. Uh, but it was a 2,000 year period. And Hosea 6 describes that as two days. Go ahead. Well, it's interesting because I just won this book that talks all about this, you know, <laughs> the arguments between the two camps. But my question is going back to evolution, all the different forms of evolution, they have different theories, right? Um, how would genetic answer, we talked a little bit about this after class, but I'd like to get a fuller answer about how genetic entropy disproves that if it does disprove any type of naturalistic evolution. Yeah, I'm a little cautious using genetic entropy as an argument against evolution just because genetics is really complicated. Okay. And uh, you know, we don't understand all the systematics that go into genetics. Uh, you know, one paper I cite is how uh, genetics uh, is a useless tool for discerning an ancestral population. That's where a lot of these debates center. So, um, uh, however, there's no doubt that uh, the genes do experience entropy. They decay over time. And therefore, we would expect that species have been here for a long time will show the greatest amount of uh, genetic decay. And uh, you do see that, that the longer they've been around, uh, the more that you see. The difficulty is discerning in the genome uh, what is a useless mutation as opposed to something that's been designed by God to serve a purpose. Because a lot of what we think are mutated genes that serve no purpose, we later discover have a function. And that's important because I've run into geneticists who will say, well, we see useless genes in the human genome that are identical to useless genes that we see in the chimp genome. Therefore, evolution explains that. That's an argument against creation. But what you discover is that what they thought was a useless gene actually has a purpose. I mean, I'll give you an example. They'll say that uh, you know, chimpanzees and humans have lost their ability to manufacture vitamin C. And you know, it is true that uh, we share that with the chimpanzees. They can't manufacture vitamin C. We can't manufacture vitamin C. And uh, you'll find uh, uh, you know, materialistic evolutionists saying that's proof of uh, the evolutionary process and proof that we humans weren't designed because if we were designed, we would have the capability of manufacturing vitamin C. What they don't realize is that it's a really a good thing that we don't manufacture vitamin C. Uh, the creatures that do manufacture vitamin C basically flood the body, their organs uh, with so much vitamin C uh, that it would do damage if they were to live as long as we do, particularly the brain. And so God wanted us human beings to be able to live 90 or 100 years or 110 years. And that requires that uh, we take small doses of vitamin C. And actually what you see in the human body and the chimp body is the capacity to recycle small amounts of vitamin C, uh, which animals that make their own vitamin C like rabbits don't do. They don't recycle. They just manufacture their own. They manufacture it in large quantities. <coughs> but we have a very sophisticated recycling mechanism, which is something that these other creatures that make their own vitamin C lack. So it's like, yeah, we don't make our own vitamin C. That looks like a defect, but it's not a defect. It's actually essential to keep the human brain functioning uh, for 80, 90, 100, 110 years. So uh, yeah, so that often happens. What we think are defects really aren't defects at all. The Human Genome Project is a really good uh, evidence for that. We used to think that 98% of the human genome was junk. We now know that over 80% of it serves a purpose, and the more we research the genome, the higher that percentage grows. Junk DNA, right? Well, there's nothing we can identify as junk. On the other hand, entropy would tell us there's going to be at least a small amount of junk. 
because, I mean, once God creates human beings, uh, that human species is now subject to the second law of thermodynamics, so you'd anticipate that there would be some genetic decay. Yeah, uh, but it seems to be at quite a low level. Go ahead. <coughs> okay, Acts 13.48 says, as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. So does that mean that some people are predetermined to be saved and others not? Yes, and probably an even more explicit passage would be one you see in Romans 9, uh, where there's a reference to Esau and Jacob, and it tells you there in Romans 9, but before the boys were born, before they had done anything uh, evil or virtuous, God had predetermined that he would love Jacob and hate Esau. And so that's a pretty strong statement about how God actually, before he created the universe, determined who would be saved and who would not be saved. On the other hand, that in no way delivers you from the responsibility of seeking after God. Because there are several places in the Bible that make the point in a single sentence, it's all up to you where you wind up for all of eternity. And the same sentence says, it's all up to God where you wind up in all of eternity. I'll give you an example, Joel 2.32 says, All who call upon the Lord will be saved, all whom the Lord our God calls. So you get both sides in the same verse. You know, and that's the paradox of human free will and divine predestination. Uh, you've got 1,500 passages in the Bible that tell us it's all up to you where you spend eternity, but you've got another 1,500 passages in the Bible that says it's all up to God where you spend eternity. Both are simultaneously true. Don't try to resolve it in length, width, height, and time. It can't be done. If you don't believe that, I wrote about that in Beyond the Cosmos. But also wrote, if you allow God to be as big as he's uh, proven to be by the latest physics, then God can predetermine before the world is created who's going to be saved and who won't be saved. At the same time, he can give all the responsibility to human beings to determine uh, who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. Both are simultaneously true. And that's one of the evidences that persuaded me the Bible came from a transcendent being. Because what I notice is every other religion denies that both are true. Only Christianity says both are true. Uh, but that tells me these other religions were invented by human beings because they show the constraints of the limits of human visualization. The Bible defies that, not just with that doctrine, but with many doctrines, like the Trinity. You're not going to be able to visualize the Trinity in length, width, height, and time, but you can in the extra and trans dimensions. And so, yeah, repeatedly the Bible says that God is chosen, but also says the choice is up to you. Well, I uh, was thinking of, of sharing a, an interesting um, report I've come across. The, uh, <clears throat> the Lord would know for sure, but I think it's based on what I call reasonable evidence, and that is that Yasser Arafat's chauffeur came to the United States several years ago, uh, or many years ago, and he expected to corrupt uh, American culture and advance Islam and all, but he met a Jew, and he was very surprised. The Jew was not at all like he expected. And after some several years, uh, he, the chauffeur eventually became a Christian. And he had regular contact after that with Yasser Arafat. He would often go back to visit him. And he'd um, present various issues in the Bible that, that were related to the gospel, or led, or were pointing to the gospel. And he reported that Arafat did not refute anything. He, he listened very rationally. And uh, later, <coughs> Arafat became ill, was in the hospital. Uh, he never confessed to the, um, uh, the chauffeur that he had been converted, but uh, the, the chauffeur reported that about a week, uh, after several weeks in the hospital, an Egyptian pastor came to visit him. And he reported to the chauffeur that Yasser Arafat accepted the Lord and died a Christian about a week wow. before. And um, I thought it was very interesting. It's 
there's no way to absolutely confirm it, but I can believe that it's true. Yeah, those kinds of things do happen. Okay, next. Uh, mine's not a statement, but it's a probably a real quick question. Um, since um, I was reading in your book on Job um, and talking about the <clears throat> animals best to tame, um, and it just was kind of striking me as, as um, and somebody had brought up the goats, um, and, and I saw how well you had done, um, but I've seen so, so many other <laughs> people in humanity with those very same animals seeming to do, I, I will saw those animals as just like kind of the worst. Uh, for instance, my gr grandfather, somebody gave him a couple of goats, um, lived by a small lake on a farm, and, and he's like, oh, okay, so uh, in Minnesota, put him in the ice house uh, to, his, to his sons, and um, or the, that's a fish house where you put it on the, on the right, ice. Right, right. And, um, to, and tomorrow we'll have the, the corral built for them and open up the door the next day, and they had eaten the entire, there was no walls left on the inside. All the insulation was gone. And so he said, go put them out on the island till we <laughs> figure out what to do, and they never saw him again. <laughs> so um, if you could talk a little bit more about, um, in the Book of Job, any tips since you did so well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I argue that uh, you see three origins of life in Genesis 1. Creation day 1, God creates life that's physical. Creation day 5, he creates life that's physical and soulish, a reference to birds and mammals and how they are endowed with mind, will, and emotions so that they can form a relationship with a higher species, namely us human beings. And then last of all, he creates one species, that's body, soul, and spirit, uh, that can form relationships with a higher being, namely God himself. And you see in the book of Job, it says, look to the birds and look to the beasts of the field, a reference to land mammals. They will teach you. And what he meant is they'll teach you spiritual lessons. As they have been designed to serve a higher species, we have been designed to serve a higher being. And so he endows them with a capacity to form uh, relationships with us. And what's interesting is how many of these animals can form very strong bonds with us. The other thing you notice is that when they form a strong bond with us, they outperform the wild animals. They can do things when they're bonded to us that they can't do when they're in the wild. And likewise, there's a lesson that when we're bonded to a higher being, uh, we can do things that we can't do if we weren't bonded to a higher being. The other thing you notice is that uh, these creatures that bond to us will also bond to one another. For example, cats and dogs don't get along in the wild. Uh, but if you bond to a cat and bond to a dog in your home, they will bond to one another. It takes time, but it will happen. Uh, and it's that common bond with us that makes them bond uh, to one another to a degree that uh, when one is lost, they'll actually mourn. So for example, uh, one of our cats literally mourned for 40 days when her dog died. It was just that strongly bonded to that dog. That was remarkable. We would take the dog for a walk. The cat without a leash would be right by his shoulder the whole time. And uh, you know, they would actually play together they both sit up on their haunches and would box one another. They would never hurt one another. But yeah, we'd watch this boxing match go on. <laughs> and that would happen night after night. But that doesn't happen in the wild. It takes that bond with a human being for that to be manifested. So, uh, and it, I think it's a special joy that God gave because people say, you know, it's to such a degree that people think that these creatures are going to be with them in heaven because of how powerful they bonded with us. But it's like, God wanted us to see how much he cares for us. We get to see how these animals, and what's interesting about these animals, they're not sinners. And so there's basically an unconditional love they show towards us, and I think there's a lesson in that as well. So, um, And what I've noticed too is that the atheists I've debated, they're urbanites. Uh, they're people who've been cut off from these lessons. And I'm not referring to our pets, because they tend to be overbred. But what I find interesting is going out to places of the world where you're engaging wild animals that have had no contact with human beings. 
There you can actually witness directly how these animals have been designed to bond to us and to relate to us. Uh, the reason we don't see that is because we abuse them and so these animals are trained to run away from us. But if they've never been abused by human beings, you see their natural uh, desire uh, to come to us, to relate to us and bond to us. And I told stories in the book of how I've actually seen that in person. Purposely went to places in Canada where I knew humans hadn't been in 50 years just to see how the animals behave. Yeah, and it's remarkable how they, they're, they're, they're drawn to you. In fact, I've got a collection of photos uh, where there was this one a woolly marmot, and they get to be 25 pounds in Canada. They're big creatures. Uh, but this one was in his little uh, hole. He saw me coming, got up out of his rock hole, got on top of the rock, and basically entertained me with a dance for about 10 minutes, <laughs> allowing me to get within three feet to take photos of this. Of him and doing, so I got photos of him doing this little dance. Now, this is an animal that had no contact with a human being before. So, and uh, you know, just a summer and a half ago, two summers ago, uh, I was out hiking at 10,500 feet, and this 450 pound bear came out. And it's like, they, they shouldn't be at this elevation, but it was. The bear was surprised to see me, stopped in his tracks, moved off the trail, sat down, and just waited for me to come close and take photos. So, yeah, and I figured, hey, you know, as long as it's sitting down, it's not a threat. <laughs> I'd be worried if it was standing, but it just just kind of sat down and took us, you know, take my picture. So I did. <laughs> you can even find that in California. Just two years ago in our local mountains, um, I was hiking and stopped for dinner. Um, and I just finished my dinner and a, uh, um, a mule deer came right up to me within just a couple feet. Just looked and stared at me and I stared at it. You know, five minutes, it disappeared. And I'm like, okay, it's gone. A few minutes later, it comes back with its doe and prompts the doe to come up to just within a couple of feet with me. And both of them just stood there and just stared at me for a while and then and then walked off. So you can find that right. even in California, which is just, just amazed me. Yeah. Um, I, got, I have an uh, internet question, obviously. I'm going to preface that with a joke. Uh, my wife one time uh, came to me and said, hey, how come you haven't taken me anywhere in a while? And I said, what are you talking about? I said, right now we're traveling 1,000 miles an hour around the Earth, and that's whooping around the sun at thousands of miles per hour, and that's whooping around the universe, uh, the center of our uh, Milky Way galaxy, uh, um, just like this picture shows. And with the expansion of the, of the universe, we're traveling even more than thousands of miles of that. Um, and, and so what do you mean I never take you anywhere? Um, um, and this relates to the question. So the question from the internet was, considering how fast all these things are moving, which the Earth is part of it, um, um, how, uh, how is it that obviously we don't feel any of that motion? You know, why, why does our, everything here have gravity to stay on, enough gravity to stay there? Or what, how does that work? Well, the reason we don't feel the motion of the rotation of the Earth, we're rotating at the same velocity as the Earth. So uh, it's zero velocity. Likewise, you know, here's our... Uh, uh, solar system whipping around the center of the galaxy at 250 kilometers per second, but because we're moving at exactly the same velocity, we don't feel it. You only feel differential velocity. So uh, you've got to be walking at a different speed than the Earth is rotating before you notice. Uh, and then the, the question there was that, was how, uh, does rea uh, gravity relate to that or not relate to that, though? Yeah, gravity doesn't relate to that. Okay, it's just, it's so, just a problem over the same speed. Yeah, okay. it's all a matter of a uh, frame of reference. <clears throat> I bring a walker just in case. <laughs> um, back to animals. Seem to have a lot of animal lovers here. Um, it says here in uh, Psalm 156, you know, TBN's big slogan verse let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And I'm just uh, thinking about horses being in heaven, and animals have breasts, so it seems like they have an awareness of God, but yet we're saying that we alone can understand God. So I was wondering if you could maybe explain that verse and comment yeah. a little bit on that. Well, that same thing is Psalm 136 you're quoting from, uh, but it also refers okay. to how inanimate objects also praise. The rocks praise God, the stars praise God, everything praises God. After all, God made everything. 
So all of it test of, they don't have breath, no. Uh, but horses have no awareness of God. The only species of life that has an awareness of God is us human beings. Well, I mean, he rode on a donkey. It doesn't mean that the donkey was aware of God, but the donkey did carry God. When he comes again, he'll be riding on a horse. Again, uh, the earthly horse will have no awareness that God is uh, riding on him. And incidentally, there's a, a symbol there, and the Jews caught the symbolism. The fact that he came on a donkey meant he was coming in peace. And they were expecting him to come to uh, conquer the Romans. And when he came on a donkey, they realized that's not what's going to happen. When he comes on a horse, that means he's coming to conquer. That happens in a second coming. In the second coming, he rides a horse because that's a symbol of conquest. Is that a literal horse? Well, I think, yeah, he's going to be riding a, you know, I don't know which breed of horse he's going to be riding, but it'll be a horse here on earth that he'll be riding, just like it was a, horse, a donkey here that he was riding. Well, it's interesting how horses and donkeys are mentioned in Job 39. And basically it says God does, you know, they're very similar to one another physically. But it says they're, they're very different in how they relate to us human beings. The donkey is motivated to keep you uh, uh, safe. The donkey wants peace. So if a donkey sees any kind of threat to you, it's going to go in the opposite direction. A horse loves adventure. And so what it tells you in Job uh, 39, when the horse smells the scent of battle, it's all eager to go into battle. And that's an amazing feature of the horse, that the horse actually desires to take you into very dangerous situations. But the other thing is, that horse will do anything once in battle to keep you safe. I mean, my uh, grandfather, my father's side, was a cavalryman, and he says five times his horse saved his life. Five different horses literally gave up their life to keep him alive. I've been a, a Christian for 39 years, and, and you're 40, right? For, <laughs> 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 that don't mess me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what can I do at this point to have a closer relationship with Jesus? Well, I love uh, what it says in Second Corinthians 4. It says, we are human here on earth, and as a human being, we witness our bodies gradually decaying away. But as a Christian, we can rejoice in getting old because the spirit renews us day by day. And, you know, that's the wonderful thing of being around people, been walking with the Lord for four or five or six decades. There's almost a kind of a spiritual glow about them because literally they've been renewed on a daily basis. So it might take you a year to realize your body's a little more decayed than it was, uh, but in a single day you can see spiritual growth. And that's a beautiful thing. So in answer to your question, I would say pursue that spiritual growth. I mean, you know, when your husband realizes you're different today than you were yesterday, that's pretty exciting. I've been uh, studying the scriptures for the last 20 years, and, and I came across, and it's, I started with your, your book on, on, on the word yom, and etern you know, days, and I came across a word, uh, it's aion, A-I-O-N, it's a Greek word, and the the commentary is that it's normally translated either eternity or forever, but it ne doesn't necessarily have to mean that. That in the context of God, it means forever, but it, it also mean it could mean age. So even hell could be like an age, or you can go. It, it, it doesn't have to be eternal. So uh, do, have you ever come across that word? Oh yeah, big time, because there's a major debate in the Christian community. Uh, is this universe gonna last forever or just a long time? And yeah, you'll find uh, a passage 
uh, in the Psalms that uh, indicates that the stars are going to burn forever. They're going to shine forever. But it's that word. And it could mean forever or it can mean a long time. Uh, and that's why I say, uh, in fact, in biblical Hebrew, there's no single word that means only eternity. And so whenever you see the word eternity in the Old Testament or forever in the Old Testament, you need to look at the context to see does it mean a long time or does it really mean eternity? i give you an example. There's also a passage that says the Aaronic priesthood will last forever. It's the same word. It doesn't mean it'll last forever because obviously there's no Aaronic priesthood today. It just means it'll last a long time. And so in the context of the stars, it's important to look up all the texts in the Old Testament that refers to the future of the stars. You've got that one passage, but you've got 11 other passages that say the stars will burn out, they'll disappear, they'll stop shining, they'll be no more. And so the conclusion is that that word olam in the context there where it talks about the stars shining forever, it's simply saying the stars will shine for a long time. It's not forever based on all these other passages that say the stars are going to disappear. They will end. There'll be a time when there are no stars. Yeah, well, I mean, like most Hebrew nouns, uh, they have multiple literal definitions. So, yeah, it can mean a long time, it can mean an age, or it can mean forever. And so, just like the word day has four different definitions, the word arrest, it's translated as earth, it's got five different literal definitions. You say, well, how do you tell which one? Look at the context, look at how it's used elsewhere in Scripture, and you say, well, you know, why didn't God use a language? Well, it's the interesting thing about Hebrew is that it's got a very small vocabulary size. And, uh, you know, the biggest challenge is translating the Old Testament Hebrew into English because English is the biggest vocabulary language that ever existed, and Hebrew is one of the smallest. And it probably explains why these debates tend to be English language debates rather than debates by people who speak French or German or other languages. Because in these other languages, they too have words that take multiple literal definitions. They did. Well, in Greek, you do have a word that does mean eternity and only eternity. Uh, but in Hebrew, uh, you don't have a single word. And that's what threw me. I first picked up the Old Testament. I expected to find the word universe somewhere in the Old Testament. You won't find it. There is no Hebrew word for universe, but they have a phrase that means the universe. You know, and I studied French because I was raised in Canada. And Hebrew is a lot like French in the sense that in English, we have a single word. In French, they have a phrase that means that or an idiom that means that. Well, likewise, you see the same thing in Hebrew. They'll have phrases or idioms uh, that mean things that we have a specific word for in English. So the phrase, the heavens and the earth, that means the whole universe. It's nine times in the Old Testament. And uh, yeah, a lot of atheists make the mistake of thinking Genesis 1-1 is speaking about planet Earth as well as universe. No, it's only referring to the universe. It's not talking about the Earth. The heavens and the earth means the universe. Uh, yeah, one of the online questions of a, a topic was um, uh, was talking about the importance of, of gravity. And if you could briefly discuss the difference between the gravity between uh, Earth and Mars and, and why they look different. Well, uh, Earth has a surface gravity of about 40% of the Earth. And that's why it would be much more challenging to walk on Mars than to walk on the Earth. Um, the amazing thing about our human bodies is how easily we are to be able to move on two feet. I mean, when you think about it, uh, take a pencil and try standing it up on its eraser. Uh, it's quite unstable. Yet yeah, here we are, a human being, six feet tall, and we're standing on these little small feet, and we're quite comfortable standing. We're quite comfortable walking and running. Uh, but it's because of our muscles and our skeleton and the fact that we live in a planet with 1G gravity. And, uh, you know, some of you 
NASA has these places you can go to a space camp and they actually let you feel what four tenths gravity feels like, one you know, lunar gravity feels like. And uh, I took my son to one of those places. It's incredible how unstable you are with a different gravity than one G. And uh, so when you see Matt Damon walking 20 miles on Mars, nah, that's not realistic. <laughs> He's certainly not gonna be able to do it that fast. <laughs> so uh, thank God for gravity. I mean, we all curse gravity when we're trying to go up a steep hill. Uh, but the very fact is, uh, thanks to that 1G gravity, we can go up steep hills. And we got a mountaineer right here at the microphone. She can testify of uh, what it's like going up a mountain. It's yes, I, I, I can. But this question has to do with how can you tell, and this is maybe old Earth versus young Earth is the basis of it, but how can you tell that the sun used to be there and now it's here and and all the migrations, that, that Jupiter and, and um, Neptune and all the, how, how can you tell that they've migrated in and then out? How, how can an astronomer tell that? Well, how astronomers uh, figured this out is that, let me bring this back here for you, the grand tag. Only with this very specified migration pattern are you gonna be able to have Mars, the size that it is, the distance it is from the sun. So for a period of 30 years, astronomers struggled with what they called the Mars problem because all our planetary formation models basically predicted that the terrestrial planets would get more massive the farther you get from the sun. And you know, Mercury and Venus and Earth fit that mold, but not Mars. Uh, Mars is only one ninth the mass of the Earth. And so for 30 years, they said, how can we get this small planet at the distance that Mars is? And they also struggled with how do we explain the characteristics of Mercury and Venus? Well, after 30 years, they figured the only way you can do it was the Grand Tack. And uh, they also said, you're able to figure out the physics of the Grand Tack, which causes a planet to migrate is its gravitational interaction with comets and asteroids. And the reason why the majority of the planets we discovered are orbiting close to their stars is that they're in planetary systems that have asteroid and comet belts that are a thousand times bigger than ours. And so there's very aggressive migration that's not reversed. And then we see lots of planetary systems where there's no migration at all. Those are planetary systems that have no asteroids and comets. Ours has five small asteroid and comet belts, and it's that unique characteristic of our asteroid and comet belts that causes uh, this migration inward, reverse, and moving back outward. And it requires uh, a special interaction of Jupiter and Saturn. And so where Jupiter and Saturn form, where Jupiter is more massive than Saturn by a factor of three, uh, and they interact with these uh, Kuiper belt objects, where Saturn migrates faster than Jupiter. They hit that one, two resonance. That one, two resonance scatters 99% of the asteroids and comets, which results in a reversal of the migration pattern. Um, we, see, we see it nowhere else. But this was all done theoretically, but it's the only theoretical model that explains the present features of the solar system. And actually it's more complex than this. To actually get the eight planets we see today the solar system has to begin with 10 planets. So one of those planets merged with the Earth, and that was important to form the moon and get rid of our heavy atmosphere and our very thick ocean. Our primordial ocean was thousands of miles deep. Today it's only four miles deep. And it was thanks to that merging event. And then there was a third planet the size of Neptune. And so we originally had three ice giants. We had Uranus, Neptune, and a fifth one. That fifth one either got ejected out of our solar system or tossed about 50 times farther away than Neptune is. In fact, there's a group of astronomers trying to find uh, that uh, planet. Uh, but without a fifth uh, gas giant planet, you can't get the configuration of uh, Mars, Earth, Venus, and Mercury. So.
Oh, okay. You're not talking about the Grand oh. Tack. You're, okay, you're talking about both. Okay. Well, I'm going to be brief because I'm running out of time here. Uh, if you want a detailed answer, there's two whole chapters on this in the book Improbable Planet. Uh, but yeah, what happened to the solar system when it was extremely young? It was born in this gigantic cluster of stars, more than 10,000 members. It got super enriched with these heavy elements and then got stripped of all of its uh, light material. And once that happened, it got kicked out by a gravitational interaction. And so, for example, when we send a spaceship to Saturn, uh, we wait for a certain configuration of planets where the gravitational interaction of those planets will actually kick the satellite out. So we don't have to use as much fuel to get it out there, and it gets there a lot faster. <coughs> Same thing, if you want to make a fast trip to Mars, you wait till you get a special configuration of the planets where the gravity will basically give you a big kick. So uh, typically it takes three and a half years to go from Earth to Mars. If you get the right gravitational kick, you can do it in six months. And so obviously if you're going to send human beings, you want to send them where they got that gravitational kick. Well, likewise, our solar system was gravitationally kicked out of its birthing cluster, and then it stopped by another gravitational interaction with a different set of stars. So it went from the most dangerous part of our galaxy and ended up in the safest part of our galaxy. How old is this idea? How old is this idea? I mean, I don't think Galileo didn't come up with this. But no, Galileo didn't come up with this, no. <laughs> uh, well, the, the group that's primarily is called uh, the Nice model because uh, there's a group of astronomers in Nice, France that launched this study, and they've literally been working on it for a 25-year period. And every year they publish two or three papers. And so right now they're trying to fine tune the model to explain in detail all the characteristics of the Trojan uh, asteroids. This is two families of asteroids that are associated with Jupiter. And so they come up with a very detailed model that actually predicts the features of those, uh, of those uh, asteroids associated with Jupiter. Um, Okay, it began to take shape as, uh, okay, in terms of solving the Mars problem, that was solved about uh, four years ago. So um, that's relatively new. And uh, as far as explaining in detail the configuration of uh, all eight uh, planets and their current orbits, uh, that's about a year and a half old. It's very recent. However, they've been working on it for 25 years. No, um, no, 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 I was just going to say, so the, so the advent of the computer probably has enhanced the, the scope. Oh, yeah, this couldn't be done without supercomputers. Yeah. It took supercomputers to do this. <laughs> Likewise, to figure out how the moon was formed and how our solar system got ejected in from the danger spot to a safe spot. Yeah. That's all thanks to literally dozens of astronomers using supercomputers. This is fairly new knowledge that you're giving. This is fairly new knowledge although they've been making progress towards it for some time. So we had a rough idea of how the model was uh, being shaped. So this grand tack has been around for, gee, about 15, uh, 16 years. But in terms of giving us a detailed explanation, uh, we're only talking the last year and a half. And what's interesting is some of the scientific reaction. Some of the scientific reaction from the unbelievers is, you know, this model's got to be wrong because there's way too much design involved to make it work. <laughs> the problem is there's no alternative. There's no other way we can explain the features. And so, yeah, the people in Nice, France says, well, you know, we don't like all this design either, but we're stuck with it. And the more they try to fine tune it, the more design comes into it. Two, two other reasons they don't like it, you, you didn't mention, obviously, is this uh, also shows why uh, our solar system is the only solar system with circular orbits. And thus, this, uh, this model has proved that there is no other life anywhere in the universe be because this is so unique. You must have circular orbits, you must have the right star. And if you take in just those two parameters by studying the thousands, the 3,000 other exoplanets, we see that our solar system is, and our sun are extremely unique. That, that people just well, that's that. true. I mean, all eight planets have uh, circular orbits. Uh, Mercury has, it's kind of the exception. Uh, but it's a very small planet close to the sun. 
And uh, we do see planets outside the solar system as circular orbits, but they're all orbiting really close to their stars. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing. If they drift in where you got big comet and asteroid belts, those will circularize the orbits. But now we live in a solar system or a planetary system where you got circuit orbits far from the host star. Yeah, and that's exceptional. Not tidally locked is the first thing. They're not tidally locked. Okay. Neptune has a lot to do with why the gas giants have such circular orbits. Is that the one that goes the other way? Um, Okay, you've got um, Venus. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I won't answer the question because we're out of time, but it is answered in Improbable Planet. <laughs> I, have, I, have some, I have some good news and bad news. It's time to end and close in prayer. The good news is, is I will not eject you from this room. So please, we have lots of treats left. We have lots of questions. Feel free to hang around and talk.